Okay, so today we'll continue on uh, looking at different way to program things in parallel, right? And on last Thursday, we did cover one of the more uh, common form of parallel programming, right? Which is the shared space. There are two more way to program message passing. I have a really, really strong belief that message passing would be something that if you want to go deeper into things like IoT, uh, networking, as well as anything that has to scale to a large number of nodes where they are not at the same place at the same time, like not in a huge cluster of server, then message passing is actually required to, to scale. And the last one, I'm not sure if you heard about GPU programming, but this is one of the one of the way to program things in parallel that are really, really getting popular these days, which is data parallel uh, programming model, right? And on last Thursday, we talked about shared program, uh, shared address space or shared memory model, where threads communicate using the shared memory, right? So you can read write to the shared variable. So can someone tell me from the lecture back last week on Thursday, what would be the annoying part about the shared address space? What could be going wrong when you program in, in, a, in the shared memory model that you have to be careful about? So what, what are the potential problems that we cover? So yes, one of them is, a, this is actually one of the, the big problem uh, to scale actually, to actually make your program really, really, really fast in a large cluster, right? You are going to run into this non-uniform memory access, not memory space, non-uniform memory access, which means that if you want to access a memory that are further away from where your CPU is, it's going to take longer time. So that's the first problem. What would be the second problem that we talk about that, that involve atomic at locks? Data rest, exactly, right? So you need to synchronize. Basically, if you want to access the same shared variable across different threads, right? You need to figure out, okay, what do I do? Do I lock them? And how do I lock them? Like lock are also being done and they are actually here, right? Uh, one of the examples is, let's say you have to use pthread in C, you might run into the rest condition, as you said. Uh, we give an example, let's say I have two threads that shared data. What would happen if thread one get hold of the data, they read the data, and while thread one is modifying, thread two comes in and say, yeah, what's the data, right? It will read the old value before thread one finishes. So the data that thread two is reading, yay, you're wrong. Basically, thread, two, thread two would read the wrong data, right? And to make sure everything is complete, you need to enforce what we call mutual exclusion. And the name in English basically kind of means that you exclusively allow the data variable that are being shared to mutually agree in when are being when that when 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 they're being excluded from being read altogether. This prevent rest condition. Uh, for example, if you have a thread that, as I said earlier, run a load, add one to the, the value and store it back, right? You want either the atomic operation where this whole thing happened at once or you lock it. The second problem that, that you can run into as uh, uh, Nongpum suggested is what we call non-uniform memory space, right? Address in the memory can take different amount of time. And you have the both on and off shift network to connect the DRAM together. Basically think about a large fleet of server, right? 
they have a server. Each server comes with its own memory. Each each of the server also comes with its own socket for the CPU. You can actually buy like multiple CPU, maybe two, maybe four, maybe eight that plug onto the motherboard, and you have a large DRAM. It can be even terabytes of DRAM. If you want to access uh, memory from the other CPU's location, you need to take more time. And this is called the problem with NUMA, right? Location of the data can impact performance. Uh, Interconnect topology can design, uh, and, and also the design itself. How do you connect everything together? Also impact performance. Load balancing, how are you gonna map everything and how you can access each of these pieces also impact performance, right? So many, many things that impact performance. The NUMA problem is a little bit more advanced compared to the locking problem. Most of the time, if you program with one computer, you're gonna run into the data rest problem. If you have to program in the cloud, sometimes you might run into the NUMA problem, especially if you need to actually do what we call high performance computing application. Let's say I want to build a program that do a large breadth first search, but the, one of the problem with graph application these days is the data is big, so you need to store it in a large cluster of machine. You can also benefit from having multiple CPUs working on the same problem, right? So you might run into NUMA problem. We also cover OpenMP, which is basically it's a library for parallel program, which kind of cover a uh, symmetric multiprocessor and it's assumed shared memory. And once installed, you can kind of basically mark your code region inside the C and C++ language and say, hey, this can be done in parallel. This loop can be done in parallel. And then OpenMP would do that for you. So this is relatively simple, but you still need to think about parallel algorithm, which is the material that we covered two weeks ago. Your program should be having high parallelism. Right, so we actually provide a little bit more info. You can take a look at both the resources on the official OpenMP website, as well as the tutorial. I mean, it's a link from this resources page actually uh, by uh, engineer at Intel, and it basically cover how do you actually deal with OpenMP, right? How do you get start? How do you get start? How you program it? How can you use each of these tools from the library, right? Uh, it supports many, many type, many form of parallelism. So you can write the code in a hopefully faster way. The next thing, the next model that you can per perform parallel computation is called message passing model. Anyone heard about this before? Okay, so what is a message passing model? So let's make some assumption, right? Here, here are the assumptions made by the message passing model. That has its own private address space, private address space. So basically, if I want to access the address data, I need to tell, hey, can I access that data? And here is the function that I want to call. So communication is done by sending and receiving messages. Right, sending messages basically will tell you. Okay, these are the recipient of the message. These are the data to transmit, and these are the optional tag. Receiver would get the messages with the data, along with the optional tag. Basically, you exchange the data through messages. You exchange the data through messages. So. Let me give you this analogy. This is one thing I love to do about basically teaching parallel programming. I can make an analogy everywhere. So let's say I want to run a country, right? Let's say I want to run a country. How many basically cities that I have to run at the same time? Let's say I'm uh, uh, some big shots that have to run a country. To make the whole country running, do I, how do I manage every city, right? So give me a number of how many cities we have in our quote unquote fake country. Someone give me a rough number. Any number is fine. Any number greater than one is fine. 
1,000. Okay, awesome. We are running a relatively big country, right? So, what should I do? What is the basic thing to do to govern the entire country with, with this 1,000 cities? They all be, will be running their own thing, right? What, what, what's the, what would be the thing that makes sense? Yes, you have the mini government, right? Something like a governor, right? The governor would govern each of the city. Think of it as a threat, right? Each of these governor is one threat. They are responsible for running that city. And you have 1,000 threats right now. Basically, you have 1,000 threats, 1,000 governor to govern the city, right? And they would have its own resources, right? Each city has its own resources. Each city has its own worker, right? So if city one, city A wants to share resources with city B, what do I do? So I have city A, this is my resources. CDB resources. So what do I do? I would well send a message. Hey, so let's say this is resource A and resource B. I say, hey, this is my message. Let's say this particular city can plant rice, right? City B has a factory that can process rice. But City A pour all the resources on just planting rice. City B, the only thing they can do is process rice. So if I want to actually have a full pipeline, well, full way to plant and process, what should I do? Governor of City A would send what to City B? Send rice, yeah. Send the data, right? Rice in this case is your data. A is threat, B is a threat. A sends the rice to threat B. Threat B has a function call. It's a function that call process rice, right? The function take an input, put in a rice here, you get an output, which is, I guess, rice prime, which is, I don't know. Uh, I, what, what does it call? How do you call the rice that has been processed? Like, like package, basically, uh, well, finish rice or whatever, right? So what B has to do is to run that function. And once I'm done, what do I do? Polish rice, I guess. I, I don't know, actually, I have no idea. Uh, I mean, to be honest, we call it rice. Uh, Anyway, so once we finish processing, what do we do? What would be the thing that makes sense to do here? So let's say I have 1,000 city, right? City C, city D, city E. B would do what? Well, one thing that they can do that makes sense is they would distribute it everywhere, right? Disperse the rice, exactly. So they would send the product rice prime to everyone, including sending back to A. Right, send a message with the data. I'm done with the rice. So once I'm done with that, right, what do I have to do? So I sold my rice, what should I get it back? What should I get back? Money, right? So in this case, everyone would pay the money back to B, right? So I would pay the money back. So I'm gonna use a different color just for the sake of like making sure the diagram is intact to some degree. Money, come back. So it's again, another message, right? And what should we do? Once we, we have the all the money, well, I mean, one thing you can do is to pay the money back to A, right? Basically, process some of the money, use it to upgrade their factory or whatever, and share the money back to A because they produce rice for B, right? And basically we can run a country 
Well, I mean, I'm basically making everything to high level. I'm not saying that running a country is easy because obviously you can look at our country and how screwed up things are, right? It's not an easy task, but uh, with message passing, we can allow each of these city to actually work with their resources, process the data on another thread, get the data back, right? And continue with the execution of whatever program you're running, right? So this is the gist of message passing. Any question on this high level? Basically, high level example. So let me ask you one question here, right? In the shared memory model, what you have is the data rest problem. Everyone wants to access the shared resources and say, hey, I'm here first, right? Over here, what could be the problem that would slow things down? Let me ask you this. What could be the problem that would slow things down? So let me be a little bit more specific and give. Yes, that's one thing. Let's say B is a slow rise processor. Let's say B is not really optimal in terms of this function call, right? Everyone will slow down. What else? So let's say I have the, I have city B only have one truck. Right? Let's say city B only have one truck. So if I want to disperse the rise to A, E, D, and C, what does city B have to do? Do it one by one, right? Some resource dependency is like, yeah, hey, I only have one truck. I am stuck here. Over here, this one truck becomes the limited in terms of the communication that you can establish at each time, right? I would send one rise at a time to each of the city. And then somehow I would somehow have to manage with one truck. Once I have the money back, hopefully I can maybe upgrade the truck, right? So these can be things that are slowing the program down. What we call this problem is synchronization problem. I need to synchronize to make sure everything is actually on progress and correct. I need to synchronize this whole messages. And here's the overall message passing model, right? So let me kind of like look at each of the threads. So I'm gonna write T1 as thread one, T2 as thread two. Right, and say T2 has a function called Fibonacci, right? That takes in input number n. And thread one has the data to say, I want to run Fibonacci, but somehow, somehow, my computer doesn't have that function. My thread doesn't know how to run Fibonacci. I need to run it at using thread two. Thread one only can access data. So say, hey, I am accessing data. Once I have the data, I'm going to send what to thread two? Hint, the name is called message passing. So what do I send? Send a message. Hey, this is data. Please run function called Fibonacci on my data, right? And once I'm done, what do I do back? Again, hint, the name. I send the data back, right? I send a message back saying data prime, process data, so I can continue running. So this is called synchronous message passing. Why is it synchronous? Anyone want to guess why is it synchronous? Let's look at the wait time. Who is waiting for what? It Yeah, it's gonna happen one by one, right? T1 has to wait. Over here, I'm waiting. Actually, in fact, let me change the color here so that it becomes red. Waiting. 
I need to synchronize. So any guess of what can I do better here? While I'm waiting, while I'm waiting, what can I do? So thread one doesn't, it's not necessary that thread one can do only one thing, right? So what else I can do? Let's say you run Chrome that have five different tabs. I'm basically processing the data in that in the YouTube that you're opening. Do other tasks, right? One thing you can do is do other tasks. This is one way you can do it. So the orange one, what we call is it can be what we call asynchronous message passing. So what if the orange task has another requirement that say, hey, I need to run it on T3. One thing I can do is over here, I send the data over, right? I'm gonna wait for the orange task to finish. And in the meantime, again, I'm coming back to thread one. Thread one say, okay, I'm waiting for thread, I mean, the, the, the blue task and the orange task, fine. Now that I have the blue task back, I can run, right? Any questions so far on, how can this be done in parallel? So one other thing that I want to tell you, there's a terminology called blocking. Block, I cannot write for some reason. Thank you, PowerPoint. So I realize when I write things too close to, to each other, they will not allow me to write. So basically while you win, if you use synchronous message passing, it basically means that this process is blocked by this communication call that is sent, right? So here's basically how things are implemented. Message passing, think done in software, done in software. Hardware doesn't have to support system-wide sharing. Basically, this message passing can program, the, the message passing program can handle the sharing. I'm not saying that hardware cannot help. There are actually quite a lot of hardware researchers, including things that I've been working on in my lab on how to actually accelerate this message passing using hardware. But in general, this can be all implemented in software. Commodity system can be connected to form a large parallel machine. So why is this good for IoT? Let me ask you this question. So this is basically more of a thought question because it's still really, really frontier engineering, but I want to throw this question out. Why is message passing maybe working well in IoT? So let, let me ask you this. What is your understanding of Internet of Things. So can, can someone give me your your own understanding of what do I mean whenever I say Internet of Things? Because I want to make sure I set the straight first. You have multiple devices connected through the internet. Let me ask you the second question. So that's that's a really really good start. That's a really really good start. Do I need an internet? Yeah, that's a great answer. Actually, every everything here, yes, local internet is fine. As long as devices are connected, it's the interconnection of things. It's not about having things connected to the internet, right? But at the end of the day, you have how many devices? So let's say I have a, I, I'm not, let me not use like weird, like military example. Let's say I have a self-driving car, like a fleet of self-driving car in the, on the street. We might see that in the next 10 or 15 years, who knows, right? We don't have to drive our own car. Each car would communicate. So how many cars are on the street these days? A lot, <laughs> I don't want to count. Too much, right? Too much to count. So 
I want to make sure they communicate, right? Can I assume I will use the shared memory model? Can I assume that each car can access the data using shared memory into the other car's memory? Can I do that? No, <laughs> exactly. That's not possible, right? But can I use each of the computer across multiple cars to do something useful? For example, for example, if I have one car that try to detect the street sign, would it be more powerful if I have the car right next to me trying to detect the same thing, trying to check, oh, is that a human trying to cross the street in this blind spot? Would it be more powerful? It's very parallel processing. It's a big, giant prog program, self-driving car, but now I'm controlling multiple car, right? Trying to make sure they share information. There's a human there. You will not be able to see it from this car point of view because they're blocking. It's, that guy is in the corner, but I communicate with the car on the opposite side that see the human. Would that be better? Yes, right? I can basically have more eyes to look at everyone who is using the street as well as the pedestrians who might somehow randomly run into the street, right? So I want to make sure everything is safe. So what can I use? Obviously, I cannot use shared memory model to send these messages. So the, an obvious solution is message passing, right? So that's why I said this is basically one of the models that Personally, personally, I believe that is the way to go. Uh, is the way to go if you want to kind of like look into uh, scalable IoT and making sure they can communicate. Don't just blindly connect to the internet. That's connecting to the internet can be good, but it can be inefficient as well. So if you want to squeeze every bit, look into this as well. I mean, it's it's the obvious obvious thing to do. Right. So how do you implement it? Let, I just told you, right, that I don't need hardware support. Basically, data sharing can be done through hardware support. But with message passing, the sharing is done through software. So obviously, this is going to be less efficient because I'm not really utilizing any fancy hardware model. But I can write a program that handle all the communication, that handle all the communication. I'm gonna basically cut with the implementation part right here because more than this is actually more like the OS class rather than parallel programming class. I'm just giving you motivational example that, hey, this is uh, another way to run parallel program, right? You can write parallel programming IoT, each UI will do their own thing, but they share data, they share information allowing each computer to run their own thing, but at the same time, sharing information is really, really, really powerful tool for parallel programmer, right? Uh, one of the tools that I, I would suggest you to, if you are curious about this direction, it's called MPI, you might have heard about it. Uh, the resources on, basically you say, open MPI on Google, you find that website. This is the one of the common interface on how each machine can talk to each other. All right. Any questions so far? Because we're gonna move on to another really popular thing called the data parallel model. So in the data parallel model, right, our assumption is this. We have a huge collection of data. So what what program? are likely to have a large collection of data. Let me ask you, what are the, one of the most popular type of program right now that need to train on a large collection of data? ML, yeah, yeah, machine learning, right? Machine learning, especially what we call deep learning, requires you to process tons and tons and tons of data, right? gigabytes data, terabytes of data. I've seen a, a paper from Facebook that uh, look at terabytes of memory. 
and another thing that is common in this, I guess, data processing, including machine learning, deep learning, and a lot of data science workload, uh, running the same operation over and over and over and over again in a large scale. For example, anyone use NumPy before? So NumPy is is basically is a Python Python library that can be used to process numbers, basically as the name suggests, right? So one thing you can do is to do a vector add. So anyone can someone tell me what is a vector add operation? Yeah, add a vector. You have vector A plus vector B, right? And you add them. Basically, in this case, A and B has six elements. So how many add are you doing? Six, right? You are doing six add in parallel. So can I do that in parallel? Actually, the first question is, can I do the six at in parallel? Yeah. All right. So I think you got the idea. This is basically data parallel model. I have a lot of data, same operation. So let's do that in parallel. Assumption number two, the data type has to be a sequence of T. Basically, there's a way you can access the elements in a sequence, basically. And accessing the data element is done through specific operations. So in the data parallel model, here are the basic operations. Map. We went through this already. What is a map? Yeah, apply the function on every element on everything, right? So you can actually optimize the operations of a map. For example, what we call map fusion is, as you can guess, what does fusion mean? Let's say I have item A and item B, they will do fusion. Anyone here watch Dragon Ball? How am I too old? It's like my age when I watch anime. Okay, Dragon Ball, right? What does fusion do to the character? They merge, right? They combine, <laughs> basically. Same thing here, map fusions, you combine the two functions together, reorganize the code for back-to-back -back map. Why is it good to reorganize your code to do back-to-back -back map? Well, you can apply the data parallel operation back-to-back. -back. It's good, yay, fast, right? You can what, do what we call prefetching. Prefetching means as you uh, as the name suggests, I'm gonna go get the data ahead of time because I know that I'm gonna need that data. Because you know exactly what elements are need, so you can prefetch. We are not gonna cover how prefetching is done. Basically, if you're curious, let me know. This prefetching kind of requires hardware. It requires hardware to some extent. Intel X86 has an extension to do prefetching. The key idea is to get the data ahead of time. So when you need to compute the operation, your data is there in the processor so you can do it fast. All right. So here are the common operation. Anyone familiar with the for each operation? What does for each do? It's looping over things in the list, right? It iterate over anything that's iterable. Awesome. By the way, thank you so much for this this answer because it's made the class much more interesting. At least you're typing something, you're thinking, and make the class much more interactive. I love it. So parallel for each would basically loop the body. Uh, and the bot bot the the function in the loop. I mean, not not the function in the loop. The body of the loop becomes your function. And you iterate, right? You iterate over everything in that list. So a parallel version of for each would basically map it, map the loop body to every element, right? 
Any questions so far? Basically, the, your entire loop body, think of it as that's one function call. That's one function call. And you map that function call over for each element. It's as simple as that. And when you finish, when you finish, let's say you do parallel for each, right? What are, at the end, what do you have to do? If you do things in parallel, what are the common thing you have to do? You have to join, right? You have to actually either, well, not either. You have to, at the end, join. And at the beginning, you have to what, do what we call gather. Gather operation. Gather operation is basically means I'm going to gather every single piece of my input so that I can apply the map function. So it's, it's basically this, gather map. And once you're done, join, but in this case, we call it scatter. And somehow we call this scatter scatter. You might hear this terminology whenever you talk about the programming paradigm. Uh, gather scatter means that gather everything that I need to apply for my map function. Once I'm done, scatter the results back. Right. Any question? So this is basically on a high level. This this is simple. You get every input, so you might you basically need to implement the way to gather. How do you gather? And then you scatter the results back. So I'm gonna cover the first primitive called gather, right? So let's say I have a vector called A and a vector called B. And let's assume that I want to just add anything that's blue here from A and B. They might align and they might not align, right? Who cares? How can I gather these blue things in A and B? Anyone got an idea on how to do that? You can obviously inter iterate, right? But can I do that in parallel? Can I gather in parallel? So how about this? I'm, I'm gonna give you all a, a, a brief, like two minute uh, mini exercise so that you get to kind of like exercise your brain a little bit. How can I get these blue elements in A and B in parallel? All right, I'll give you all two minutes. I'm gonna time it on my phone. Stop watch. Oh, watch it. Let's do a timer. All right, go. So, I'll, I'll tell you how in in a bit. Uh, I know that the PDF of the slide have the solution, but it, it's okay. I think it's good to kind of do a practice think about okay, how do I do this in parallel? Okay. <clears throat> So I'm giving everyone two minutes. Feel free to grab a piece of paper. Think about how can I get the blue things from array A and B in parallel so that I can apply our map function. And again, the result of the gather would have to be in sequence. So it should be in the correct sequence.
All right, it's already been two minutes, so I want to basically okay, let, let me go through the solution. Uh, I guess back. So you use the two minutes for your break. It's also fine. But okay, let's say I have an array GA, which is the gather outcome of the array A, right? I just draw the index of the elements I want to gather on A. So what should I put in GA? Can I put in the index so I know exactly where is that element? Yes, All right? you can put it in the index. Two, four, five, seven, and nine, right? Oh, my bad, not nine. I said nine and I write in eight. I don't know what happened to myself, sorry. How about B? So let's say I want to do the reverse order. I want to start with the last element. So what should I put in the GB? Yeah, I can put eight, seven, five, three, and one, right? We call this the index vector. The index vector is whatever index we want to need. Basically, we want to take from A and B. Let me ask you this. If basically this is pointing back to the elements we want to gather, right? Two, four, five, seven, and nine. Right, and the second array, I have eight point to here, seven point to here, five oops, point to here, three points to here, and one point to here. Right, you, you can now refer back to it to the element. So, this is called the index vector. And the result of the vector is to gather elements in the index back, uh, vector. So can we do this in parallel? Uh, so that's a great question. So your question is, okay, we have the index vector, but how do we get these indices, right? Uh, these indices usually, usually both A and B have the index to the elements. So basically that's why you can get the index vector. You know exactly, I'm gonna get the second, fourth, elements and then seven and five, five elements and then nine. So that's one of the thing that is by default assumed you know it. In in the array or in the vector, you have the indices already. So you can use the index vector. You need to make sure when you have the gather operation, you need that index vector. All right, so, so I know it doesn't really answer your question in a sense, but how do we get these indices? The answer is, is there. Basically, it's going to be in the in the data format that you have to index. And your operation will typically tell you what's the index. Then you perform the gather operation on the index vector because you can go look it up in parallel, right? I can look it up in parallel. Why can I do that in parallel? Am I doing any writes here that would end up in the data rest? No, right? You're not going to run into data rest so you can gather everything in parallel, right? This can be done in software in parallel or this can be implemented in hardware. Anyone heard about AVX2 and AVX512? Okay. Uh, anyone heard about Linus Torvalds or the guy who invented Linux? Uh, anyone heard about the comments that there was an article back in, I think, July of last year that say, hey, I hope Intel AVX 512 die a painful death. Uh, AVX 512 is the extension to the Intel ISA. Intel ISA is basically your assembly. Uh, it, think about it as this is your assembly language that you can use to program any ship that use Intel and AMD X86 architecture. Basically, is think of it as an assembly language. AVX2 and AVX512 is the extension to that language that allow you to do these kind of operation in parallel. It can be really, really nice. 
actually. It can be really, really nice. But in, in a lot of cases, uh, some people, for example, Linus, who most of the time he just work with OS, right? So he doesn't really need this library. So he think otherwise, I mean, there can be application that benefit from it, right? So, so AVX 512 and AVX2 is basically uh, the extension that allow you to do parallel operation, right? So if you can extend your program using AVX, typically your program will be fast. What's the downside? What's the downside? It can be annoying to extend it, right? So most of the time, people who program will do this in hardware. They they are not gonna extend this thing in using NSX assembly. They are going to likely implement this in software. So, oops, I already have the gather examples here. So can I skip, or should we do another example? Okay, so let's do another example, right? So there's a comment say another would be good. So let's say I have vector A again. And now this time I'm going to put in both the data. And the index. Let me put the index first because it's simpler. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. All right, time for you to put in random number for me. Give me some random number for A and B. I'll I'll, I'll put it in the order I see on the chat. All right, 17, 43, 21. All right, 69, okay, five, two, or 20. Don't make it too long because I cannot write in that box. I think three three digits is fine. Anymore, I need some acrobatic skill. 6, 6, 6, 13, 89. All right. Four more number. 77, 8, 2, 0. Awesome. So let's do an index vector. Index of A and index of B. And let's say I want to add five number together, right? I want to add five number together. I'll continue from the last number you put in here, five. So can you put, give me some number between zero and six? It can be the same repeated number. It can be the same repeated number. Three, three, okay. Zero. One, all right, and then one more one. And this time zero and nine, between zero and nine. Two. Nine, eight, okay. Five, okay, that's all. Thank you so much, by the way. So now let's do gather A and gather B. What will I get once I call gather A based on the index vector that I have here? And what will happen if I call gather B based on my index vector that I have right here? What is the number when I call gather A? So use an orange color. What's the number represented by index number five? You go to this. You go here, right? Oh, that's number two. So you put two here. Two. And then the index number three, 69. Now index number three again, 69. Index zero, you have 17. Index one, you have 43. With me so far? Basically, you look at the index, that index become whatever that element in the vector that you're accessing. That's it. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. So what about gather B? What number should I get? Eight. 
eight, okay. And then two, right? And then zero, because you look at index nine, it got zero. You get index h, so that's two. And you get index five, that's 89, right? So basically that's your gather result for uh, index of b, right? Any questions so far? So let's say I want to do multiply. Right. The result of the multiplication would be what? So let, let me put the result somewhere uh, in blue text right here. So this is 16, right? 8 multiplied by 2. 69 multiplied by 2, that is 138. Everything be multiplied by 0 is 0. So 17 multiplied by 2 is 34. I don't want to do that multiply. My brain is too fried in the afternoon, basically it's 43. <laughs> Sorry guys, 43 multiplied by 89, whatever that damn number it comes into, right? So basically this is the process. You gather everything, do the operation by map. In this case, you map a multiply operation. You can map everything that you want to map, right? And then you scatter the result back. Scatter the result back can be done the same way as scatter, basically. You can put have, for example, you can have an index vector that say, okay, the result goes to these particular elements in array C, right? Uh, any questions so far? Okay, so, so this is the part that I want to cover for the purpose of the class, right? I'm gonna babble on, but we do a break first. We do a break first, but I'm gonna talk about, okay, this seems awesome. This seems like you can do things in parallel. Anything that comes afterward that I'm gonna talk right now will not be on exam, anything here. is good slash nice to know will not show up on the exam for the purpose of making sure everything is still soft at level. So let's do a five minutes break. We'll come back and let's talk about how can hardware help? Can we squeeze even more performance using the concept of parallel programming. All right, so we do a five minutes break. We'll come back at 106, is that okay? Okay, so let me pause the recording and see you all in about five minutes. Okay, so I'm resuming the recording. So as I said, everything here will not show up on the exam, uh, but I want to kind of let you know what are the state of okay how do i paralyze things and what should i do things that you should do and things that you should hopefully avoid right so in in a sense of traditional multi-threading right as i said earlier each strat each strat is assigned to run on one of the cpu so threads can run this on a single node machine in parallel, which means that you use what? Share memory, right? So you use share memory to synchronize data across the thread. Uh, this is applied to Numa machine, as we said earlier. Thread can run across a cluster of data machine, uh, a cluster of machine that share the data. And in that, uh, in that case, you use a remote procedure call or message passing, MPI, message passing interface to actually share the data at the end of the day at the end of the day the data is shared so you need to make sure there's a way to manage the shared data think of the running the country uh, example right you have resources and you have cities that uh, in your country and you want to make sure you manage the shared resources so that everyone is happy and everyone can be uh, basically doing effective job at what they're supposed to do. So to get performance, 
right, to get performance. Let's say we have written a nice parallel program, right? What we developed earlier, back two weeks ago, is your parallel program should be work efficient. So what does work efficient mean? Anyone still remember what does work efficient mean for a parallel program? So comparing to a single thread version or non-parallel version, the work of the parallel program should be what with the work of the sequential program for that to be work efficient. Oh, anyone here? So the work should be equal. Basically, the parallel program, the amount of work you have to do, it should roughly be the same as a sequential version, but you have parallelism, right? So the other thing is, the parallelism should be decent. Anyone remember what is decent here? What is O of what? O of something with N. Parallel work should be roughly the same as sequential work. This is O of square root of n, right? Assuming that everyone is still here because everyone is so silent, these are what it means. So let's say we have a nice parallel program. Let's do quite a few big questions. First of all, how does this really give us performance? Right, and what else can we do to get even more performance, right? So the first question is, how do I measure? How do I measure how fast is my program? How do I measure how fast is my program? Because so can someone tell me, how can I measure the speed of the program or the performance of the program? Give me some metrics. So let's say you run a game a uh, big O notation is obviously one way to do it, right? But big O notation is more to do with the algorithm itself, right? It, it, it tells you how good is your algorithm potentially, right? That's a nice answer. Compare the time from the program start to the finish. We call this a wall clock time, a wall clock time. Sometimes we call this end-to-end -end latency, or somehow we call it execution time, execution time. This is important because that's basically, that's what you care about. At the end of the day, you want to measure the execution time, right? What else can we use to measure the speed of the program? Instruction to put, what does it mean? Basically, how many, how many instructions that we can execute Within a unit of time. Within the unit of time, right? So this is a common uh, metric that you can use to measure how many, say, add operation, how many multiply you can do within some unit of time, say within five minutes, within 10 minutes. Right. So this is a measure of throughput. What else? Oops, sorry. I skipped slide my back, my bad. Right. So let's assume getting the data is free. If you want to know the upper limit, you have what we call the CPU clock speed, right? You have the clock speed. This is what you see in nowadays. If you buy a CPU, they'll tell you how many gigahertz is your uh, CPU clock. You have what we call issue bits. What is an issue bit? Issue bit is each CPU that you buy nowadays, that, that you buy, they can actually run more than one instruction within one cycle. They can run four, maybe eight, right? Depending on how fancy is your, your CPU. So it means that if I have an issue bits of eight, potentially, potentially, I can run eight things in parallel. 
what does faster clock speed do to an instruction execution? So why do I want a, a CPU that has a faster clock? Basically, one instruction would take less time, right? Hopefully, hopefully. It doesn't always be that the, that's the case. This, this is not always the case, but hopefully one instruction would take less amount of time. In reality, it's more like within the same amount of time, you can do more things, right? You can do more things. So the possible maximum instructions for the CPU throughput is basically one over CPU clock. That means that in one second, I can run these many, these many instructions. And then each of it tell you in a clock how many instructions you can do. So you multiply the two numbers together. I have the approximation there, right? So what are the problems here? What is our assumption that you said earlier? What is assuming something is free, right? This is a huge assumption. This is a huge assumption. The problem with this model to kind of like measure how fast things can be is getting to your data is not free. Getting to your data is not free. So these are some of the things that queue performance. And sorry about my animation bug. I'm so sorry about this, but these are some of the things I'm going to cover in this. Oh, actually different number now. I think it's 227 composite arc, which is actually the next uh, block, 2 to 4 p.m. that I'm going to cover this discussion soon. But going to get your data is actually really slow. Right, really slow. Getting the data takes about 10 times longer to do than adding, especially when you have a shared big data structure because they do not fit in the cache. So you take the system skill class before, as well as a compass arc, you will then realize that these can make things a lot faster or slower. The reason why I said this is not going to be covered in our this class exam is this is the part where you kind of like take a few classes and then you put the things that you learn together and you're like, aha, that's why sometimes when I write a parallel program and it's still slow, right? Things that we learn in other classes can come in here. CPU is designed to hide this long operations, long data access operation. Uh, there are many, many things you can do here. I'm not gonna go into the detail on the hardware design. So this is one of the things that queue performance. Getting to the data can queue performance. If else can also queue performance. Because uh, Reducing the possible, it, it kind of reduce the possible optimization the compiler can do, and we will not cover this in this particular slot and particular semester because I'm basically thinking about covering how to write codes on GPU. Right, I'm going to cover GPU programming rather than this particular um, problem with branches. But basically, right, again, Tom arc will talk about the overhead of branch misprediction. Whenever you have a lot of if else, think this way. If else can be bad for performance, so minimize it. Right. What else? We covered this already. Data synchronization, barriers, right? These are things that can, these are the only slide that is relevant solely based on this class, so it might be on exam. Data synchronization and barrier, atomic operations is good, but locks can actually kill performance. Every time you lock things, you lower the performance. Why? Can someone tell me why every time you lock performance? Or, I mean, not like that. Every time you lock something, it 
reduce the number of instructions you can do in the cycle. Can someone tell me that? Why is locking things back? Basically, why, 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 when, whenever you need to use a lock, you slow down your program. So that's a part of it, actually. So if you lock things, how many, how many people can access that piece of data? If I lock something, well, one, right? The only one that has the lock will get to access. The rest go away outside. I have the lock. Imagine this, there's only one bathroom and somehow I need to use a bathroom. What do I have to do? I lock the door. I lock the bathroom door so that I can use the toilet, right? And please don't unlock things when your friend is using the bathroom. Uh, so I unlock the door, I use it. While I'm using it, I'm going to lock that door. What does it mean? So let's say it's just a big food poisoning going on at NUIC and it's only, there's only one bathroom. What are you going to do? Everyone would likely to need to use the restroom, right? And it's going to be bad because it's a shared resources. Everyone demand it and at the end of the day, you're going to lower the performance, right? So every time you use a lock, every time you use a lock, you lower the performance because only one entity, only one entity can use that resources. Everyone else has to wait. Everyone else has to wait. These also get complicated as things can be because you are L1 data cache can be out of date. This is really, really important topic in computer architecture. I forgot what's the course number now. It used to be ICCS 221. Uh, this is now a special topic class. When we actually open the class, I forgot what the name uh, it is called computer architecture, but I forgot the number. But we will cover that in this class. It's more advanced than Comsys Arc. We call this the uh, coherency problem. It has to do with how do I make sure everyone still see the most updated version of the data and who can modify the data. So what about things that are read only? So this is the last question that are relevant to Rust actually. This is really relevant to Rust. What about read only things? Can I access them in parallel? If I can guarantee that this data is read only, do I need a lock actually? Not really, right? So the only thing you apply is called a read lock. A read lock basically means that no one else can modify the data because everyone is reading from it. Everyone is reading from it, so don't modify the data. That's why immutable is good, right? So that's the part about things that can queue performance. What about hardware, right? What about hardware? So hardware can help. Uh, anyone here heard about Intel hyperthreading? So remember our message passing, right? You have T1, you have T2, right? And you send a message, T2 run, send it back here. And you have this awkward wait time in the middle. So what should we do while we're waiting? We, we said that earlier, but what should we do while we are waiting? Yeah, do something else, right? It can be running th thread three on the same CPU. The problem is when you switch, when you switch, this thing take time.
it's kind of like human, right? So if I ask you to do two things at once, let's say you are working on the homework for this class while at the same time you're trying to work on the homework for a different class. When you switch, do you have some date time where you have to think about, okay, what did I do earlier for this particular assignment? Right? So, so while you're doing this, it does take time to switch between one task into another. Handware multi-threading is say, basically what they say is this, okay, if you have to switch, it does take time. So let me modify your brain, modify your brain, so that there's a really, the, there's a memory of what you did earlier, so that when you switch, it's almost instant, it's really fast. You can switch between two things really fast, so that's hardware multi-threading. Basically, oh, why, why are we only executing one thread of execution, right? You have, you basically enforcing some limitation, you need to context switch, this is done in a software by the operating system, and it takes time. So the idea of hardware multi-threading is this, let's maintain the partial memory of what I did earlier for multiple thread of execution. So that each of the thread can switch back and forth and back and forth and back and forth a lot faster, right? So what would be the benefit here? You only have one CPU anyway, like you have one processor. So at the end of the day, you can run one thing. But if you have hardware multi-threading, and let's say that one thing run into something long, such as having to go to the desk or having to go to DRAM, I switch, I do something else while I'm going to get the data, right? That's the concept of hardware multi-threading or Intel hyper-threading. So at the end of the day, it's likely to make things faster. This Intel hyper-threading, sometimes we call it simultaneous multi-threading, right? For example, as I said, getting the memory is long. Getting your data is taking more time, 10 times longer than doing an add or multiply, right? So what we can do is while I'm waiting, I'm going to switch to another thread to keep the CPU busy. It allow concurrent execution of useful work, right? And this hardware context switch can be done almost instantly, almost instantly. So here's the trade-off, right? Trade-off is, well, you need hardware support. You need to actually have the ship area to support it. And you also need to think about, okay, when do I switch? Do I switch upon L1 miss or do I switch upon L2 cache misses? These are, again, advanced topic. If you're curious about this, feel free to check back with me uh, either on Discord or email, right? The reason why I brought this up, because the GPU use a really crazy version of that called fine-grained multi-threading. Think of SMT or simultaneous multi-threading or Intel hyper-threading, but on steroid, on steroid. So what do you mean by doing this on steroid? Every time the processor is not doing something, I'm switching to a new thread. I'm switching to a new thread. So if I assume I have unlimited memory bandwidth and I have these operations that I can support, Right. So what's the worst thing one operation would take? Let's say the worst thing is basically memory access, right? So in this, from this number, from this number, how many cycles in the worst case it would take to finish one instruction? Just look at the number alone. What's the maximum number here? 100, right? I have a memory access operation, so that would take 100 cycles. So that's the worst case that can happen. I say that hardware multi-threading allows you to switch really quickly. So if I know that in the worst case, my instruction would take 100 cycles, how many hardware threads do I have to maintain to make sure I never have to stop? How many times do I have to switch until my memory access come back? Assuming that each switching is only instant and I can run something else in the next clock cycle. 100, 
right? If I have 100 concurrent things going on, 100 concurrent things going on, and I can switch from one thing to another instantly, then I never have to stop to wait for my data. I, I stop for that one thing, but in the meantime, I'm doing something else. This makes the GPU really, this is one of the reasons to make the GPU really fast. The other reason is basically they do the add and multiply in parallel. They do 32 adds in one cycle. They do 32 multiply in one cycle per GPU core. Note that this number is false with certain particular downside because you have unlimited memory. So I assume unlimited memory bandwidth, right? So if I have an unlimited bandwidth, I can go to the memory as much as I want. This, this, this is not a true thing, right? Your memory has certain bandwidth. So that's generally, generally, that's what limits the GPU performance. So the GPU of graphic processing unit take what we just said earlier, fine grain multi threading, add what we call SIMD or single instruction, multiple data to that. And we'll cover, we'll cover what the heck is SIMD in the future lecture, likely to be next week, because on Thursday, I kind of want to wrap up the other concept called lazy evaluation. But GPU basically allow you to run the similar instruction really, really, really fast, right? It performs fine-grained model threading and assume data parallel program, something we learned today, data parallel program, right? This is nice. You can do lots and lots and lots of add in parallel. You can do lots and lots and lots of multiply in parallel. What can kill GPU performance? Things like if else, if else is bad for the GPU. Diverging memory instruction, we are not going to cover that, but this is another thing that can kill the uh, GPU performance, right? Another thing that kill, like murder, actually, murder the GPU performance is if you run single thread program, if your program is not parallelizable, then don't ever run it on a GPU, right? Don't ever run it on a GPU because it's going to be slow. And that's actually it for the lecture today. Uh, I want to leave more time for the Q&A for your project in case you still have questions. So let me first pause.